Yeah. Okay, so, so the church, you know, we talk about this basic structure. Yeah, I mentioned this basic structure of the scripture, the garden. And the, uh, the church fathers, especially sent out from the Syrian, he separates the garden into different sections as well. And so the Garden of Eden has the Tree of Life, which is at the top of the mountain. And then there is the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil, which is at a lower sphere. And then there is the Fig Tree, which is lower. And then finally, at the bottom of the mountain, you have this wall with the angel protecting the garden. And then you have the thorns, which are on the outside. Okay, so you can kind of imagine this basic <clears throat> structure. And then this structure is then repeated in the temple itself. So you have the Holy of Holies where the presence of God descends, which is equivalent to the Tree of Life. And then you have a, a holy place, which would be one step further back. And then finally you have the, the outer court, which would be even further down the mountain, if you will, further away from the garden. And then the outside is the land of thorns, outside of the temple itself or outside of the tabernacle. For example, in Herod's temple, there was even a court for foreigners. So in very far out, there was a court where uh, people who were not Jewish were allowed to come. But so you can, so it was always like more and more restricted as you moved in towards the Holy of Holies. So the church has a very similar pattern. In this part, we are in the narthex. And the narthex is a transition part. So it's a transition between the inside and the outside. And so when, for example, in the traditional Orthodox liturgy, we, nobody does it anymore, it seems. But traditionally, there is a point in the liturgy. The first part of the liturgy, it's for, ev it's for everybody. People can just, could, could just come. The catechumen could come. If you, were not, uh, if you were not Orthodox, you could be there. And then at some point in the liturgy, they chase out the catechumens. After the sermon. After the sermon. So they read the gospel. They, they have the sermon, and then they say all the catechumens should leave, and all the catechumens would walk out and would come into the narthex. And traditionally, they would receive instruction. They, would, they, they wouldn't go home. Like, they would receive instruction. They would, they would have some kind of teaching for them. But then, at some point, they close the doors of the church. They would actually close the doors of the church, and there would only be the communicants who would stay inside. Now, you really have to understand this this structures to help us understand how reality works. It's to help us participate in the way that, that reality works itself. And so the narthex, although we don't do that anymore, it still liturgically plays that role. So for example, if, if a child is going to be baptized, they start out here, they're received at the door, and there are some prayers at the door of the church, prayers of exorcism, you know, and then the person has to spit to the West, to spit at the devil, and then they're let into the church. So there's this whole kind of drama of this entering into the church from the outside, moving in towards the, the inside of the church. Another aspect that you see in, uh, for example, in Greek monasteries, you'll see that a lot in, the, in more modern times as well, is that they have the Greek philosophers in the narthex. And so we have icons of the saints inside, but on the, in the narthex, which is this transition, space it's still a space to celebrate the intermediary forms even of ancient culture and so knowing that the greek philosophers although they're not christian we can't just put them inside right but they're also we use their language we say we use the word logos we use all these words that were developed by these greek philosophers and some ideas as well and so we hold them in this intermediary place and this is a concept like if you've read dante you'll see the same thing. Dante does the same thing with Limbo. He has this intermediary space, and then he puts all the just pagans in this intermediary space. And it's mostly to understand this thing. Remember I talked about this idea also of the foreign, which is outside? And so the church has this space, which is this transition uh, towards the inside. And ultimately, we can understand it is also the place where the glory of God can also, it doesn't stop at the door of the church. Right? There, it continues to move out into the world from the narthex out into the world as well. It's not just contained inside the church. Although there is a hierarchy, it's not contained inside the church. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. 
And so if you turn around, you'll see the icons that are represented here. And so there are different traditions of what you represent in the narthex. Um, like I said, sometimes you represent warrior saints or sometimes you represent uh, uh, you know, transitional figures like the, the, the political figures or that kind of stuff. And here we have the Annunciation, which is here, um, which is also, yeah, sorry, on my left, which is also the, the, the name of the church. And so you come into the church and you see right away the Annunciation. You see Gabriel announcing to the Mother of God, and she is holding. Can I? She's she? Holding a spool of thread. Yeah. It's so usually, machine. yeah, usually she's holding a spool of thread in her hand because she was mending the veil of the temple. She was she was participating in making the veil of the temple. So this is all part of our symbolism of the Mother of God as being the Holy of Holy herself. That she is the Holy of Holies. She is the Ark of the Covenant. She's all this imagery of the place where the theophany happens, of where, of where God manifests himself. And then on my right, we have the nativity icon. Um, and so in the nativity icon, you also see, you can see it's similar. It's almost as if they're, they're related to each other. If you look at the, the Annunciation icon, you'll see there's this ray of light coming down from above. There's a glory above and there's a ray of light. And in that ray, there's a little bird most of the time. And so you can see the Holy Spirit coming down on the Mother of God. And here you see again this glory and then you see this ray and the star, the Christmas star, which is above the cave where Christ is born. And that cave is also in a certain manner the womb of the Mother of God herself. It's this holy place. It's this, this, this place of the theophany. All these images play on each other in terms of understanding the idea of a place where God manifests himself. And in the nativity icon, what's important to understand is you have Christ, you have the logos represented as hidden in creation. And so he's invisible, right? No one knows. And then you have, this, you have these people who find out and then they're drawn in towards this invisible place. And the, the drawing in is, if you look at the image, it's a cosmic, the image of the nativity is one of the most cosmic images that, that we have. You have the lower aspect of society, the, the shepherds who are coming in. You also have these wise uh, figures who are coming, the wise men who are coming to see. And the wise men are also foreigners. So you have local people, you have foreigners, you have the lowest class, you have the highest class. And then you have above, you have all the angels which are participating in this event as well. So it's really a cosmic event. Do you want to add something, uh, Father? I'd like to add to, there is a tradition too where the narthex is dimly lit, whereas the church proper is brightly lit because we come from the darkness into the light. And uh, this, this uh, as Jonathan mentioned, this idea of liminal entry into the church. Uh, it comes from the Latin word that means threshold. And the Yachad, the community that, that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, had a similar type of, of entry into their, into their community and where the, the initiates into the community had to stay outside as well. For, for, the, for the practicing Christian, for the baptized Christian though, it's also a place of preparation. You know, we don't just, well, some do, but we shouldn't. You don't just come in and throw yourself in the church, sit down in the pew, and, you know, like you're watching a movie. There's a point of preparation. So you see the beeswax candles here. Beeswax is important because it smells really nice, right? It's all natural. And there's, there's definitely an emphasis on natural, especially with lights, although we have electric lights here, too, about oil votive lamps and things like that. We'll talk about that later. But the idea is that you light a candle, and there's, there's two, a practice uh, of lighting two candles where you come and you light one candle, you'll come to the left side, and then you remember the names of the living. You'll come to the right side, and you'll remember those of the dead. And in this way, you're preparing yourself, you're praying for others outside of yourself, and you're preparing yourself to enter into the, the kingdom, into paradise, as it were. Now, you'll see this, as an engineer, what it appeals to me is this inner harmony, this, this inner you know, logic to the services. So you see the living on the one side, the dead on the other. When the priest prepares the gifts on the Todiscadion, on the paten, the Lamb of God is in the center, the and on the left, uh, the bread. You know, it's risen, the risen, not lamb lamb, that comes up after. <laughs> uh, 
at the home. But the, the, the lamb is, is the, we use risen bread in the Eucharist. On the left side, particles are placed for the living, right? And on the right side, particles for the dead. If you see the icon of the transfiguration, Christ is in the center. On the left is the prophet Elias, Elijah, who never died. He went to heaven in a chariot of fire. He represents the living. On the right is the prophet Moses, who died on Mount Nebo, and he died a natural death, so he represents the dead. So you see this kind of inner consistency and inner harmony. In terms of icons, also what's very important is the benefactor who's donating them. <laughs> and so if they have a particular saint and a devotion to that saint is their patron saint, they'll have that icon put there. So that will, 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 in terms of, there are fixed icons and then there is some flexibility to it. Um, just a last note, if just to give, give an idea of what's happening here, when you see, you'll see it in the ortho, in the, in the, in the, the, the script there, Oadios Iolani, he said, you several letters are stacked there. And he's blessing. In his, in his hand is a scroll that says, Metanoita Indikigari Basiliotoronon. Repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. It's coming. Okay? All right, yeah, we can go, we can go, we'll go in into the church room. proper now. So the, the, traditional, the traditional church has a few basic patterns. Um, there's the basilica, which is most, the one that in the West has become the most prominent, which has a longer, like a longer space and then an apse at the end. But the church, the church structure that really took up prominence in the East is really this structure, which is a dome on a square cross. And so here we really do have like a basic, very, very simple version of that. Sometimes it becomes very complicated. And when you're in the church, you, you don't necessarily see it right away. You kind of have to, 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 to get it. Sometimes there are more domes. You can add domes. You can add all of this. There, there are different additions you can have. But the basic structure of this church is like almost like a tight, like it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a classical type of that exact structure. So you can see the round dome, and then you can see that each, on each side of the dome, there, there's the extension uh, of the cross. So the basic, the basic structure is really just heaven and earth. That's the basic idea is you have, you have the, the dome of heaven above, and then you have the earth below. You have to think in a flat earth universe. <laughs> You have to, not in a flat earth universe, you have to think in a phenomenological universe. You have to imagine that what you experience, that has reality to it. If you go outside and you look up, you see a dome. Try not to see a dome. I don't know what you're going to see. That's what you experience. We experience this dome and it ends up having a symbolic um, import as well because it's, you have this perfect shape of the circle and then below you have a stable shape, which is a square, and you have four corners, right? we still think that, we still say north, east, south, west. Like we, if you look at a map, it's still organized that way. It still has the four directions. And so we have the same thing. And the four directions then also become the extension of the cross itself, which extends out into the world. So you have the dome, which is the, the invisible part, and then the visible part is this extension. You can understand it as the, in, in paradise, there was the top of the mountain, and then there were four rivers that came down the mountain. And there they are, those four rivers. It's, it's the same thing. You have four directions, you have four rivers that extend from the summit and, and, and fill, up the, fill up the world. Um, now, this, this is the first time that I see this set up in the, in the, 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 the church. Most churches, most churches now will have an image of Christ up in the dome. Now in this church, they put the image of Christ up at the top of the arch. But most churches will have an image of Christ up in, in the dome. And it's Christ as the Pantocrator. It's Christ as the great judge. It's also Christ at the ascension. The first images of Christ up in the dome were images of the ascension. So you see, you would see the disciples around, then you see Christ up in the center, 
because the angel said that he will return in the same manner that he left. And that's, that's it. That's the, you have the divine logos is right there above at the very top, the summit of everything. He's above everything and the world is manifested through his speaking, through his, his speaking creation, his judging the world. We always see judging as a, as a bad thing, but judging is also just deciding what is what, right? Giving identities and judging is the same thing, actually. Giving a name to something and judging it is, is the same act. And so we have this setup. And here, the, you can see the four, the four angels. Um, in Hagia Sophia, this is how the pendatives are, are done. Sometimes there's also the four evangelists are there. Sometimes it's four angels, but with the, 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 different, a, the different heads of the, of, the, of the tetramorph. So you have the man, the lion, the bull, and the... Why am I forgetting one? The lion, the eagle. <laughs> it's like... Um, and you can imagine it as... The, the, we, see, we talk about this in the liturgy. We talk about how Christ is carried by the hierarchy of angels down carried down to us by this, this hierarchy of angels. And this is the thing I, I was talking about, is that in the Christian world, the hierarchy is not, we, we were so ruined by the modern world because we always think that hierarchy, hierarchies are bad. The hierarchy is always bad because they oppress us or whatever. And sometimes it's true. But in the Christian vision of the cosmos, the hierarchy is the way in which we are able to all participate together. And so the angels carry down the, the, the presence of God to us and we sing with the angels and we, we, we raise ourselves up into that song with the angels. We're all participating in the thing. Yes, Father, you wanted to say something? The word hierarchy in Greek means holy order. Hieros, right? Archie. Yeah. And the, the church fathers, and indeed in the early church, they prayed for order. They realized that the, the Roman state, the pagan Roman state that was putting them to death, that was persecuting them, they prayed for them. Because they realized the world without order was worse than the world even with a despotic order. And so order hierarchy was, and actually, and according to Chrysostom, hierarchy was an imposition of the fall. It was required to keep order. Right, yeah. The, 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 let's say the, God is not subjugation, superior, inferior, but... It's participation. It's the way that we participate in, in, in the things above us, you know. If you, one of the difficulties when you don't have hierarchy, and you see it all the time, is that you say, it's just me and God, right? You hear that a lot, Christians. It's like, I don't need all this other stuff. It's just me and God. The problem that happens usually is that you, they think it's me and God, but it's actually me and God. Because there's no hierarchy to show them how lofty and how infinite God is, they make God into just some guy like my buddy, you know, my friend or whatever. Not the infinite origin of all things. It's just something that is extremely accessible in that sense. So hierarchy helps us to understand both the, the distance that separates us from God, but also how we are actually completely connected to God at the same time. Um, and so... Is there something else you want to say about the dome and the square? I'd like to contrast the dome too to the steeple. Because the steeple is man's finger reaching up to God, right? And, and the dome is God, as, as Jonathan said, coming down to man. And you see a distinction between the modes of theology, theological discourse, and orthodoxy in the Western world. Orthodox theology is characterized as apophatic. And we see that in the prayer of the first antiphon, in the liturgy, where we use the words like a method or Anoitos, ataritos, afectos, unspeakable, unimaginable, un, un, uh, immeasurable. So God's love is beyond compare, beyond uh, expression. You won't hear similes used, like God is like a waterfall, because a waterfall has a beginning and an end to it. And so the, the idea of the dome, of God coming down to, to man, is really a contrast to the rationalism that exists, especially in the scholastic period. West, we were trying to figure out by asking questions of God and, and kind of in a scientific way trying to figure out who God is, which is an impossibility because if God is infinite, you know, go in your backyard and try to come to infinity and see how you end up, right? You're not going to get there. And so, uh, as we said too, the, the pandocrator, kratao means to hold, right? So the pandocrator is the one who holds, that's why he's the authority, he holds all in his hand. The autocrator, he holds pow power in himself, democratia. Demos, demos hold the power, people, democracy, 
holds, holds the power. And when you see him holding a book, we get this all the time in the churches, he's not holding the Bible. He's holding the... The Book of Life, yeah. Gospel. Or the Gospel, do you think, though? It's his Gospel, right? In the Book of Life. And as Jonathan is saying, you see this here, and some churches you see that there. You know, we think of orthodoxy as, as, as formed and rigid, but there's a flexibility, there's an elasticity and an expressiveness, but it happens within a framework. So you won't get Da Vinci saying, you know, you, Da Vinci goes and says, well, I don't have to pick, you know, John the Baptist like this, this little, little chubby kid here, and a little chubby Jesus crawling around the feet of Mary. You won't, you won't get that. There has to be the form because they express the icons, and I'm sure John will talk about this, express the transfigured person, but the historical person. I was in a pizza shop. Imagine a pizza shop in my room. I was in a pizza shop in Vermont, and I looked at and a little icon, like that big, in the distance, I said, who's Tanasi? Who's Tanasi? I said, he says, my father's Tanasi. How do you know? Because you've got St. Athanasius there. He goes, no, it's not St. Nicholas. Flip it over, bring it to me. Ath- and it said St. Athanasius on it. And he says, how did you know that? Because I know what my saints look like. I know what his beard looks like. I know what Nicholas beard looks like. It doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like so Nicholas. it's expressing an historical uh, reality. Last comment on the dome. This is the envelope. All of it. Here used to be there. Middle. In the middle, because they were this under the dome. This western, no orthodox, right under the dome. <laughs> it's carpet, no carpet. Outrage. In other words, no microphone. So you're right under the dome, under the big dome, acoustics, so they can hear you. And the the, the, um, the envelope is symbolic of, of the stone that sealed the tomb, right? So, so it's lost on us now. Over here. But in the center, it makes perfect sense because the, the, the pulpit's there, the envelope's there, in the center, right under the dome, there's the tomb right there, the stone that seals the tomb. Mm-hmm. And also, one thing on the dome, it's very biblical, this kind of architecture, because uh, the, well, the Bible doesn't say the purpose of life is, well, to save your soul and go to heaven on cloud nine and to play a harp. The only thing the Bible says is we're waiting for Christ to come. And so this is biblical because it, you said that the whole thing ends in Revelation where it's the marriage of heaven and earth. It's that heavenly city. And it's also the imagery of the marriage as yeah. well as the city at the very end. And so that's what this is depicting. In other words, it's as if the sky is falling on you. So when Hagia Sophia was first built, the first people who walked in it were afraid. Uh, yeah. It seemed as if that dome was going to fall on their head. And it's supposed to be, because it's supposed to um, portray this idea of the, the, the coming of Christ. Correct. And that's what the Bible is leading to. But we, in a very rationalistic, rationalistic and very individualistic way, we superimpose Western ideas that the whole purpose of life is to save my soul. Very individualistic. And we, 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 um, we ignore the community, the communion, the church, the body of Christ. All those things have, been, have gone by the wayside. Yeah. You want to ask? The dome also, I believe, uh, is the original design for what carried over from mosque architecture. Yep. I yeah, the Hagia Sophia is the basis of all Islamic architecture. Yeah. Um, the other thing, Father, what you said really helped me to, to, to think of there's something that I forgot to explain is that all of Christian art, iconography, architecture, the, the, the layout of the church and the way the icons are laid out is, is all eschatological. That is, it, it is all a participation in the things to come. It's all a kind of, uh, co- the capacity we have to glimpse or to participate in the final state when all will be accomplished, when all will be revealed. In the early churches, it, it was very dramatic. The very early churches had, you know, the 24 elders and had all this stuff. When I, a lot of people tell me, you know, Christians, we, we don't need this Old Testament stuff, right? We don't, why do we have altars and, and the Holy of Holies and, and, uh, and all that stuff? But it, this is, there is no lamb on the, on the altar in the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. It's not there. It comes from Revelations. It all comes from Revelations. It's in Revelations that everybody is turned towards the altar and there's a lamb on the altar and that we're all bowing towards the altar. It comes from the eschatological moment where everything is revealed. And so the, the church decoration and the icons and all this is all based on this, this capacity to participate in the eschaton. And you can imagine the, the, the icons, the, when you see the saints represented in this certain manner with the, a mark of their holiness, with a halo, 
uh, with gold and all of this is the same. It's, it's the peeking into the totality of their being in the eschaton. It's the capacity we have already to be in that moment and to participate in it. We should probably talk a little bit about the solea too. This area is solea, technically defined as solea, which is from the altar to the pulpit in the center. That was the, the solea there. Over here we have the bishop's throne. The bishop's throne used to be over here. Whose throne was that? Emperor. The emperor's throne. The emperor's throne is over there. Despite. Yeah, well, <laughs> when, when the Ottoman Empire, when Mehmet II conquered Constantinople, 1453, May 29th, Tuesday, but we're not there. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 it was the millet system under, under Turkish rule, the millet system divine, broke up based on religion. Now, sometimes religion and ethnicity matched up together for, for Jews, for Armenians, but the, the, um, the patriarch of Constantinople was responsible for the, the Orthodox Christians under his charge, and he became the ethnologist leader of his people, the Christian people, and that's when he assumed that position there. Over there is the Psaltiri on the chant stand. The tradition is that there are two chant stands for what's called the typical chant. So one chant stand will chant the other the songs back and forth, and that is attributed to the nation's pantheon, who was a late first or the second century uh, saint of the church. Regarding the bishop's throne, the original throne was in the middle yeah. of in, the in, altar in, in, to the synthron. The synthron still back. Because that's the image of the kingdom. Correct. Because the bishop would be his tipon ketopon christu, and he would also have all the presbyters with him. And in the place and type of Christ, the bishop. That's Ignatius of Antioch in the first century. Where, and this is, you know, some people like to, as, as John was alluding to, some people want to kind of all hang this on Constantine's head. In 312, you had he defeats. Uh, Accentious the million bridge, six miles outside of Rome, 313 in the of Milan, and then 325 the First Council. But this all predates that. This is apostolic. Ignatius of Antioch was consecrated a bishop in 70 AD, if you want to use that term anachronistically. And he was fed to the lions in, in 108. And he wrote to the church in Philadelphia, not in Pennsylvania, but, right? Where the bishop is, there's the church, surrounded by his presbytery, his presbyters, his diaconi, his deacons presiding over the Eucharist, which is truly the body and blood of Christ. So we have the ecclesiology of the church, the hierarchy and of the church, people and, all the, and, all the, and all the people in one place. Correct. But Clement of Rome talks about this distinction that John was talking about. There is a place where the laity do not cross over for the place of the priest, for they are the ones who preside over the sacrifice. That's 98 AD is when he died. Well, is, it, is it true that a lot of the Oh, there is a certain tradition that, that Constantine Paleologus, Constantine XI, the last emperor, it was a Jeopardy question too, by the way, Constantine Paleologus, <laughs> Alex Trebek didn't get it out of his mouth, Paleolo, Paleolo, but Constantine Paleologus was taken by an angel and marbleized. <laughs> yes, marbled. there's a lot of crazy stuff. He'll be demarbleized. There's a, yeah, there's also a tradition that the, that the last liturgy in Constantinople when the, the Turks came, that all the, the people, the presbyters, everything kind of like disappeared into the walls and that they'll come out to celebrate the liturgy once again. So, so let's all go back downstairs because we're going to run out of, uh, out of time, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this visit of an Orthodox church. The church was the cathedral of the uh, Greek archdiocese in Boston. And the priest with me is Father... Dimitri Tonius, who is the dean at the cathedral there. If you enjoy these videos, please go ahead and share. It really helps to get the word out. If you appreciate what I'm doing, you can also support my efforts financially. You can go to my website, thesymbolicworld.com slash support. There you will find different ways to do that. Supporters get an extra video a month, uh, usually an interpretation of a story or, or some phenomena. There are also different tiers of access, ways to ask questions in advance for my Q&A monthly, and also ways to have uh, different types of meetings, monthly meetings, yearly meetings with me one-on-one -on -one to talk about your questions or your own symbolic project. And so everybody, thanks for your support, and I will see you very soon.